This mathematics video will be about the question, what is zero to the power of zero? Well, there's an old mathematics joke about someone who asked their lawyer, what is two plus two? And the lawyer said, well, what would you like it to be equal to? And the lawyer, in fact, gave the correct answer because no symbols in mathematics have any meaning until you have defined the meaning and you have the freedom to define them to be anything you like. So a very simple answer about what is zero to the zero is that it is either undefined or you can define it to be anything you like. It is, in fact, the wrong question. The correct question is, what is the most useful definition of zero to the power of zero? And it turns out there are two answers to this. Um, the problem is that although we write x to the y for exponentiation, this is really two different functions. And we get a different answer for zero to the power of zero, depending on which of these two different functions you're talking about. Now, you don't usually notice that this is ambiguous and refers to two different functions because these functions are nearly always the same. So the two different functions are x to the y for y an integer and x to the y for y a real number. Let's take um, x to be greater than or equal to zero in both cases. And you may say that the function x to the y for y an integer is really a special case of the function x to the y for y real because integers are special cases of reals. And nearly all the time you would be right, but every now and then this isn't quite true. So let me give you an example when it's not quite true. So suppose you're trying to calculate 2.0 the power of two on a computer. And you may actually get a different answer depending on whether this exponent two is a real number or an integer because computers usually store integers and real numbers in different ways. So an integer will be a 64-bit word and a real number is encoded in some complicated way with an exponent and numbers after the decimal point. And the computer calculates exponentiation in two different ways. So if we have 2.0 to the 2, where this number is an integer, the computer will work it out by just multiplying 2.0 times 2.0 and getting the answer 4.0, unless there is something badly wrong with your floating point unit. On the other hand, if you ask a computer to calculate 2.0 to the 2.0, where this number is a real number, what the computer will usually do is it will use the rule that x to the y for x and y real is given by x of y times the natural logarithm of x. So it will calculate 2.0 to the 2.0 as x of 2.0 to the natural logarithm of 2.0. Now, when it calculates a natural logarithm, it can't get the answer exact because it only worked for so many decimal places or binary places or whatever. So um, there may be a small error introduced in this, and it might give you the answer 4.0, but it might give you the answer 3.999999. Nine, or it might give you the answer 4.00001. So as far as a computer is concerned, um, the two functions, x to the y, where y is an integer or a real, are very slightly different and may in fact give you very slightly different answers. Well, of course, that's only works on a computer and surely in mathematics, um, these two numbers are going to be the same whether or not this is an integer or a real number. And yes, they are the same in mathematics. However, um, in the special case of zero to the power of zero, you do get a slightly different result, even in mathematics. So let me explain. So let's first of all look at x to the y for y an integer. Now, if what if um, let me write um, 
I, I get confused writing y for an integer. So let me write x to the n for n an integer because it's traditional to use n for an integer. Now, if n is greater than zero, x to the n is normally defined as x times x times x and so on, where you take n times, rather well, obviously. And this has the rule that x to the n plus 1 is equal to x to the n times x. And now we want to extend this to n equals 0. And if we want this rule to hold for x non-zero, this implies that x to the 0 equals 1, so that x to the 0 plus 1 equals x to the 0 times x. Well, for x not, if x is equal to 0, um, then this still leaves 0 to the 0 ambiguous. Um, but this shows for integer exponentiation, we should at least define x to the 0 being 1 for at least when x is not 0. Well, what about when x is 0? Well, we want to choose the most useful definition. So we want to choose a definition that gives a nice answer most of the time. So let's look at some examples. So the first example, m to the power of n, here I'm taking m, n to be integers, is the number of functions from um, an um, n element set to an m element set. I hope I've got m and n the right way around because it's incredibly easy to get these the wrong way around. So let's just check. So for instance, 3 squared should be the number of functions from a 2 element set to a 3 element set. And you can see that any function um, has to take the first point to one of three elements. There are three choices. And the second to one of three elements, there are three choices. So there are three times three functions. So um, I actually managed to get it the right way around for once. So zero to the power of zero should be functions from a naught element set to a set with naught elements. And this is kind of really confusing. How many functions are there from a set with zero elements to zero elements? And um, if you think about it a bit, you'll realize there's exactly one function from a zero element set to the zero element set, which is the sort of empty function, which takes no values on the domain. But that's OK, because the domain doesn't have any values in it. So um, the number of functions from a zero element set to a zero element set is, in fact, one if you're really sort out your definitions carefully. So this suggests that 0 to the 0 should be 1, at least if this is an integer as well. Um, now let's look at a second example. Let's look at the following geometric series, 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. Now if x is absolute value less than 1, you know this converges and is equal 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 minus x. Well, um, we can rewrite this series in a slightly neater form. We can write it as x to the 0 plus x to the 1 plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. So here we're writing this as sum of n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n. So now we've got this value x to the 0. And in order to make um, this equal to 1 over 1 minus x, even for x equals 0, we see, well, all these terms here are going to be 0, and this term is going to be 1, so 0 to the 0 equals 1. So if we want, if we want, if, if for x equals 0, we want x to the 0 plus x to the 1 plus and so on to be equal to 1 over 1 minus x, this forces 0 to the 0 equals 1. So, um, the point is, it is convenient to define x, to define naught to the n to be 1, um, sorry, naught to the naught equals 1 if the exponent 
is always an integer. So if the exponent of x to the y is an integer, because of course zero is an integer, but anyway. Um, so that's not a proof that naught to the naught equals one, because you can't prove zero to the zero equals one. It's just zero to the zero is anything you, you want it to be. What I'm saying is that the most useful value is one. I'm not saying it's true it's one. I'm just saying I'm going to choose it to be one. So that's done the case when you're raising things to integer exponents. Now let's look at the case x to the y, where we allow y to be real. And again, I'm going to take x to be greater than or equal to zero because taking negative numbers to real exponents is uh, occupied, opens a whole can of worms. Um, so what would we like this to be true? What would we, we like zero to the zero to be equal to? So what's the most convenient value? Well, suppose you've got a function f of x to the g of x. And you want to look at the limit of this as x tends to zero, say. So what does this tend to? Let, let's suppose that the limit as x tends to zero of f of x equals zero, and the limit as x tends to zero of g of x is zero then the limit of this should be, let's put a question mark, zero to the power of zero. So that's the limit of f and the limit of g. So in order to figure out what zero to the zero should be, all we have to do is to work out the limit of this expression where f and g both tend to zero. Well, let's figure this out. f of x to the g of x is equal to the exponent of g of x times the logarithm of f of x. This is if f of x and g of x are greater than zero. Now we've said that g of x is going to tend to zero. And f of x tends to zero. Well, f of x is tending to zero. That means this bit tends to minus infinity. So this is x of zero times minus infinity. Well, this is meaningless. The problem is zero times minus infinity conventionally means, you know, what is the limit if you multiply something very close to zero by something very close to minus infinity? In other words, a large negative number. The answer is the limit can be anything you like. If, if, if you tend to zero very rapidly and to minus infinity slowly, this limit will be zero. And if you tend to minus infinity rapidly and zero slowly, the limit will be minus infinity. And it can be anything in between. So this just isn't defined in general. Um, well, most of the time, the limit will be one. The reason for this is that although the, the, the logarithm of f of x will tend to minus infinity, it will tend to minus infinity very, very, very slowly. Um, so most of the time, g of x will tend to zero faster than log of f of x tends to minus infinity you see what I mean. So the limit of this will very often be zero. Be, the limit of this bit will very often be zero. So the limit of the exponential of it will usually be one. So we could say that, that zero to the zero is usually one, but sometimes not. So let's give an example where it's not. Suppose you take e to the minus one over y squared to the power of y squared. So here I'm taking f of x equals e to the minus one over y squared. Sorry, I seem to have switched x and y. Take f of y equals that. And g of y equals y squared. You can see g of y has limit zero as y tends to zero, and f of y also has limit zero as y tends to zero, but um, this expression is always e to the minus one. So, so as y tends to zero, and you think of the limit of this as being zero to the zero, we find zero to the zero is now e to the minus one. So um, 
you can have an argument for zero to the power of zero being any real number you like by um, choosing suitable f of x and g of x. So let me summarize recommended values. So recommended values for zero to the zero is one if exponents are integers and undefined if exponents are allowed to be real. Um, if you have to define it when the exponents are real, um, the least worst choice is one, but this is really, really, really not recommended. It's um, defining zero to the zero to be one when the exponent is real is kind of like cycling around without a cycling helmet. Most of the time you will get away with it. Every now and then if something goes wrong, you will really, really regret doing this.